if you take the mud out, you increase the oxygen. If you cut the bushes down, you increase the daylight. And oxygen and daylight equals life. There is only one Richard Waddingham. There are farmers that love nature, there are farmers that, that tolerate nature and, and, and may be persuaded by nature. And you've got Richard Waddingham, that his whole life has been driven by nature. Farming is about doing the best with what you have got, the climate and the land. And he arrived on a farm with 40 ponds and he basically saw his chance and he learned how to manage them and he learned what the ponds could offer in terms of wildlife and almost everything we've done at some point he told us to do. He's been a magnificent inspiration for, for everything really. I see soil types and climate variation as advantage, not disadvantage. And I grow eight different crops. Never heard of cattle. Well, we've got a little field here, a typical North Norfolk field, quite small. Um, you can see a pond over there, so it's typical to have a pond, but this particular field's got two ponds in it, and somehow these ponds have survived, they've not been filled in. They're only little ponds, but they've, they've survived, and they'll probably like to survive um, forever now. But they're completely overgrown. But these are classic candidates for restoration this year. The willow is completely crowded in, and we've got hawthorn all around this side, and bramble on this side, and the open water zone is this tiny little patch of grey, bacterial rich water and um, we've sampled in there and our, our net was pretty empty and you can see there's no plants in there or anything. That's the typical scenario of Norfolk ponds. There's no amphibians here at the moment. We haven't found any amphibians at all. We're gonna have to dig it I think because I can I sense that there's, there'll be at least a meter or so of, of poorly rotted down leaf material here which is sapping the oxygen out of this pond. When we look at maps uh, before the 1950s and then we compare it with perhaps 1970s, 1980s maps, the landscape's completely changed. I mean, a field like this may have had more hedges in it, but some of the bigger fields in East Anglia were, you know, they're one big field now which would have had 30 parcels of land and many of those 30 parcels would have had a pond in them. So the, the scale of pond loss is, is enormous and they were filled in um, just to create more cultural land. Five thousand miles of hedgerows are grubbed up each year by farmers in England. The need is for larger fields, wherein to operate their fast, heavy machinery. And the typical thing that they did was they would take the hedge and you take the hedge bank out and you burn it and you push all of those stumps and all that soil into the pond and level it and then plough over it and then that pond is forgotten. You could fill it in pretty quickly uh, the beauty of it is for us is you can also dig them out pretty quickly and we're hoping to shift the balance in, in favour of uh, digging them out. So got... the idea is you're going to keep a, 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 clear, a clear water or a clear piece of water in the middle? We want some open water in there, yeah. it's, so, it's so shaded It'd be so low in oxygen because of all the organic matter. Right. And if we can get that out, we should be able to bring it, you know, yeah. put some oxygen back in the water again, basically. I would imagine there's centuries of mud yeah, in that I, corner. No, I, nobody on the farm yeah, would remember exactly. it ever never being been, done. Never been done out. No, the yeah. other one has been done. That has been done yeah. out, yeah. But that was an awfully long time ago. Yeah, that's right. And Peter's father swam in it for yeah, two that's or three it, like a swimming pool. Yeah. So the chalk has yeah, got a chalk bottom. It. Well, they do look like swimming pools when you, yeah. when you do them, you know. <laughs> but we have sampled this in the past. Right. And there's literally very little in it. Right. So there's no water here at the moment. And when we'd be here in the spring and this would be full, there might be a metre of water here, but there's literally no oxygen in it from top to bottom. Maybe a tiny bit at the surface. As a consequence, we just find so, so little living in it. Uh, any fish that used to be here have 
have gone and there did used to be fish in this pond in the past. The crucian carp was here. This probably would have been good for great crested newts in the past. Mm -hmm. But really it's it, it's it's now gone the full stage of the succession. It's it's a dead pond effectively. If you just cleared the trees out actually from around this pond, um, it, it might improve it slightly but it would wouldn't wouldn't really change the oxygen in the pond. The oxygen is so low because of all the decomposition of this organic material on the, on the bed. So you need to take this this sediment out as well, as well as removing the trees which are providing that supply of dead leaves to it. Um, so we're bringing light in and bringing oxygen back into the pond basically. So he's now sort of sculpting the pond to its original contours. He's taking off the um, organic black muds and just exposing this lovely marl layer here which you can see is very close to the surface. And that's a real marly clay. He won't remove any of this marl, that, that stays put, that's the natural base. Marl's a clay lime uh, subsoil, so it's what they used to dig and spread on the fields. Um, and they were digging it probably from the 17th, 18th centuries. Clay lime dumped on the fields to improve the texture of the soil and the quality of the soil. And then suddenly that became defunct. They stopped about the First World War when they started getting stuff out of packets and they had other, way, other ways of fertilising fields. And what we're hoping to do here is by doing this at every pond, by sort of celebrating the natural you know, contours and dimensions of each pond, every pond we do in, in Norfolk will be different. Uh, and that's got to be a good thing. You know, rather than to some prescribed solution for ponds, these are all going to be different and they'll celebrate what they were like in the past. Are you ready for oxygen? 11.39, temperature 16.6. When we first started restoring ponds, we had no idea what was going to happen really. We had a, a kind of um, general theory, which is based on common sense, that if you allow light into ponds and if you allow wind to circulate on the ponds, we would expect certain things to come back and grow, we'd create good conditions for growth and then for invertebrates, but there was no scientific papers actually stating that, so we had no proof. Lacophilus minutus, Ifidurus ovatus, Hygrotus confluens. I think the most surprising thing is the speed at which a pond that has been restored then colonises and the biodiversity and the, the amount of biodiversity that returns. That's really fantastic to see. People naturally love ponds, I think, and the enthusiasm passes on. Emily Alderton has been doing some work on uh, on ghost ponds, which is a name we sort of coined to catch this idea of ponds that have been completely filled in, where the land has been reclaimed for, for farmland, and they exist as small depressions in the fields. So these ponds are quite an interesting opportunity to see how long the plant seeds and some of the eggs can last. Uh, the only research that's really been done on the longevity of these things uh, is in lakes where the lake is still there, it's still an aquatic habitat. Uh, here you've got a very different scenario where the whole aquatic environment's been completely lost, it's been filled in, it's been ploughed over and then spread with fertilisers and pesticides. Uh, yet still we're finding the seeds remain viable when you dig back down to where the pond used to be and they can come back to life fairly quickly. That, I think, it's quite an unusual pod McGeaton. Yes. Many seeds of aquatic plants and um, the stoneworts especially can last 700 up to a thousand years in some cases. She's looking at before and after studies of ponds and and the species that come in after restoration, and that's been incredibly enlightening. And you need the scientific evidence. We well, can see it, but you need the scientific evidence to really, to knock the, the point home.
just been looking around this pond edge um, and I think we found a uh, holly leaf naiad. So that's one of the rarest water plants in the British Isles. And now it's just starting to advance out of its stronghold in the broads. So these ponds are providing little dispersal pathways for this species. So it's just amazing to see this plant here just six months after we've done this restoration. Just amazing. <laughs> I've only ever seen this a few times in my life, so um, seeing this here is a is it really helps I think support what we're doing the fact that this plant has arrived you know we, we're not just restoring common species we're restoring things which are nationally threatened rare things um, that just I'm chuffed a bit basically Comes at the size of that bubba. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. The Crucian carp is a really lovely little little species, and it's a species which had a real stronghold, um, especially in Norfolk in England. So when we started work on the Crucian carp, there are just a few pockets of them left. Uh, we've been searching for it for about five or six years now, uh, and we've we've now found uh, I think I say 25 or so populations. We can definitely take the Yeah, and the rest. They are looking healthy, aren't they? There would have been thousands of ponds that contain Crucian carp, and I think going back in time they would have been eaten. That's Absolutely good, yeah. wonderful. Beautiful fish. Yeah. Very docile. There's one in here, that's a few of these are wonderful size. Yeah. So we've just arrived to conserve them just at the point they were disappearing, so I think we've hopefully arrived just in time. That's the best catch we've had, I think, so far. I'd say we've probably got 200 here, but we'll count them and see. You right with that? You right, yeah. yes, you right with that? Oh, yes, sir. After you, sir. No. Where we find them, we, we, we tell the farmers and landowners to look after them, and they get excited, and they usually do. We're transferring fish from two ponds into three ponds. We've got 60 fish to take from this pond and 20 will go in each of the buckets for the other ponds. Randomly taken. Um, randomly taken, so we're hoping we'll get a mix of male and females. And size course. And then the next pond we go to, we'll, end, we'll tend to top these buckets up, so we've got a mix of fish from the two source ponds. Um, so that's the aim, is to kind of get that genetic mix. Right, 155. Five. in. That's it. 59.6. Cheers, Tim. Uh, superb. No worries. So you got that, too. Right. All right, next one's on the board. Yep. Uh, so that is 163. They're all going into ponds which have no Crucian carp in, but we either would have had Crucian carp in the past or are very suitable places for Crucian carp. We're trying to put back what was there, basically. It's amazing how quickly everything's come back. You know, within about four or five months, we had dragonflies back here. Uh, it's just fantastic just to see the life back into it and the water's clear, which is part of the reason I think that Carl thought it would be good for the Crucian carp to be introduced. And we think there were fish here in the past and the, the sort of ancient maps that you can find. It has it down as a fish pond at one point, as a moat and other points. So we were sort of quite keen to reintroduce that. These come from two different ponds, so we've got two different lots of genetics, hopefully. So here we go, then, Carlotta. <laughs> we'll come back here in two years' time, and uh, we'll set fikenets in here and just see how they're doing. And hopefully they'll they'll be breeding, and hopefully we'll have another population established. Yeah, there we're done. Hey. What have you got? <laughs> Wait, Chris, you? Shut up. Oh, the early purples are here as well. I believe it. Mm, lovely mature male, great crested newt. And the really distinctive thing is this white flash on the tail, which is what he uses to uh, woo the ladies as he uh, flicks his tail at them. It's just so exciting, really, really quite emotional experience. We're at Shooting Close Pond, which is the second pond we did um, about a year and a half ago. I just can't believe the difference. Really pleased with how this one's uh, come along. But yeah, it's really at a great stage now, so this is what it's all about. <laughs> the 
This one's especially nice because you've got a deep hole there in that end, it shallows up here, then you've got a, a ridge in the middle which you can see is being colonised by emergent plants in the middle and then another basin over there. Yeah, this pond was restored by Richard, a full-scale tree removal, sediment removal thing. And then now all he's doing is light management. He's just every so often, he's stopping this pond from succeeding back. You especially get water beetles in this very shallow, vegetation-rich water. This, this is the area they particularly like. So they're a really brilliant group for describing habitats and looking at biodiversity. These ponds are fed by spring water which is water coming up, not water draining down. You let the sun in and you increase the oxygen equals life. We've got just over 40 ponds on this one farm. Oh, you are lucky, Richard. It's nothing to do with luck. It's knowing what to do with what you're responsible for. Richard really is a, is a massive inspiration for us, really. We came to his farm about 10 years ago. He said, come and see our farm. We've got 40 ponds. Uh, you might like what you'll see. And I thought half heartedly, I thought, well, we might as well just go and see this, this farm. And we came here and we, and we just couldn't believe what we saw. All had lovely clear water, they were full of plants, they were vibrant with life. And sort of, we started a relationship with him. I think the um, alder, they either need halving lengthways or they need halving height-wise because there is an, obviously an enormous crop of um, leaves fall into, fall into the pond. Well, that's the very thing you don't want. So in a way, he, he's a great inspiration. He started us researching ponds, started us trying to understand ponds. He showed us pond management, which we've now transferred elsewhere. We wouldn't have known any of this if it hadn't have been for Richard. Ponds are located in um, a boggy, unproductive area of the farm, hence being a pond in the first place. When I look at the ponds on Richard's lands, which have been managed for years, in comparison to unmanaged ponds, which have been left generally since the Second World War, um, Richard's ponds support much higher levels of birds and invertebrates um, than do the unmanaged ponds. So that there's, there's something happening within those ponds which is supporting that bird life. Richard's farm is a real a shining example of a model that we could use and expand throughout Norfolk and throughout the rest of the country. Boosting bird life, boosting aquatic invertebrate life without having any impact on the productivity of the farm. Farming like this in a more sensitive way which actually gives something back to nature will be required because otherwise within another lifetime or half a lifetime we won't have any birds left and the impact of that will be really dramatic on farming, on productivity, on many other things because all these things are linked up. It's water that sustains life and if the water's dirty it's no good for all species. Homo sapiens has complete power and is over impressed by his own power but if uh, we lose species don't forget we're one of them. <laughs> it's as simple as that. <laughs>